Following the victory against Ariovistus at the start of the Gallic Wars, Caesar left his men to winter in Gaul, and he returned back to his province of Cisalpine Gaul. There, he settled his duties as governor and also levied two fresh legions, naming them the 13th and 14th. This was the birth of two very famous legions in Rome's history, but one of them will be hailed as perhaps one of the most iconic legions to ever exist. And this is the full history of Rome's 13th legion, which bore the lion as its emblem. I'm aware that many of you are fans of HBO's TV series Rome, so I feel like I have to mention that the protagonists Lucius Varinus and Titus Pullo actually did exist and were recorded by Caesar himself. However, the TV series incorrectly places them in the 13th Legion, when in fact they were both centurions of the 11th. But I'll make sure to mention them when I cover that legion specifically. With these two fresh legions, Caesar met up with his other six wintering in Gaul. Unlike the 13th and 14th, these were experienced veterans, most of which had won many battles in Hispania and Gaul. So the rookies had much catching up to do to earn the same respect Caesar had for his other legions. Throughout the following weeks, the legions marched against tribe after tribe, forcing them to surrender by winning minor engagements. The 13th would have participated in subduing the Susans, Ambiani, and Belovaki tribes, each day learning of the art of war from the more experienced veterans guiding them. The next tribe they had to face were the Nervii. According to Caesar, they were the bravest of all the Gauls, and Caesar was sure they would put up a much larger resistance than the other tribes. For this, he placed the two fresh legions behind the others, as he was not yet confident in their abilities to face such a fierce people and hold the line. When Caesar's veterans began constructing their fortifications next to the Sabus River, the Nervii ambushed them, supported by other fierce Gallic tribes. The Romans were caught completely unprepared. As for the rookies, they still did not know what was going on up ahead. As they marched to the top of the hill several hours later, they saw nothing but chaos. Several legions were completely surrounded, and there were Gauls within the half-constructed Roman forts looting the baggage train for supplies as the Roman non-combatants ran for their lives. Caesar's auxiliary Treveri cavalry, which he considered the best in all of Gaul, was also on the run. Convinced the battle was lost, there was no reason to believe any of it would end well. There were soon several thousand Gauls that saw the recruits on the hill and charged for them. The centurions restored order and commanded the legions to hold. This was the first time the 13th engaged in a full open battle, and it was against some of the toughest tribes in all of Gaul. Despite the chaos, the two brother legions held off the charge bravely, while the fearless veteran 10th legion routed the other Gauls up ahead. The battle was a Roman victory, and despite the 10th legion stealing the spotlight, Caesar mentions the bravery of his two fresh legions in his commentaries. In Caesar's mind, this turned out to be a great test for his new recruits. They were convinced the battle was lost, they had a clear path to fall back, and they even saw other respected units falling back. But they still chose to stand and fight. He would have expected this only of his best veteran legions, not a fresh one. So this would have been a great addition to the reputation of the 13th legion. In 51 BC, Caesar traveled with the 11th and 13th legions to the territory of the Beturix tribe, which was rumored to soon launch a rebellion against the Romans. The quick presence of the legions ended all thoughts of opposition. In his commentary, Caesar states that the only reason he took the 11th and not just the 13th was because the land of the Beturigs was too vast to be controlled by one legion. This is yet more proof that Caesar started to favor the 13th more and more as he was considering just taking them alone against the whole Gallic tribe. He later even placed the 13th legion right next to his favorite 10th during the Battle of Dragovia to protect his flank. After many more battles, Caesar had positioned his legions all over Gaul to make sure no further tension was to occur there. But the real tension was happening back in Rome. With the destruction of a massive Roman army at the Battle of Carhai in the east, the Senate ordered both Pompey and Caesar to give up one legion each to aid the eastern frontier. Both triumvirs obeyed. Pompey gave up one of his legions, and Caesar gave up the 15th legion, which was stationed in Cisalpine Gaul. But according to Caesar, the Senate was receiving two of his legions, this is because the legion that Pompey gave up was raised in Caesar's province and so belonged to him and was not Pompey's to give. Caesar sent the 13th to replace the 15th's old position. To make matters worse, in a few weeks he received word that both of these legions did not sail to the east, but were instead given to Pompey. It turned out that the Senate has been very insecure about Caesar playing the conqueror in Gaul. He defeated Ariovistus in battle, who was the king of the Suebi and an ally of Rome. Then he raised 10 legions when the Senate only gave him permission for 4. And just overall, Caesar has been very defiant to the Senate. From another point of view, Caesar probably got caught up in something he had no control over. 
He defeated Ariovistus only because he slaughtered other Gallic allies of Rome, who later begged the Romans for aid. He then encountered more and more opposition from the Gallic tribes and had to raise more legions to deal with them. But if Caesar was to obey the Senate, he would have to give up all his legions and carry out the punishments for his actions that he and the Roman people thought were heroic. This is perhaps one of the most controversial moments in all history, where historians are split between whether Caesar's actions were justified or if he was indeed a tyrant. Caesar sent one more messenger to the Senate, stating that he will indeed agree to surrender his army, but only if Pompey surrenders his as well. The Senate at this point was mostly supporters of Pompey, and they considered Caesar's offer as a declaration of war. They immediately gave Pompey full control of the armies of Rome and declared Caesar an enemy of the state. From this point, Caesar believed that war was the only option. He began planning for an invasion of Rome. As much as I'd like there to be a complex reason as to why the 13th legion was picked in particular, it's very probable that the answer to this was simply because it was the only legion in the area at the time. When Caesar sent it to Cisalpine Gaul, he did not yet know that the 15th would be given to Pompey, and so most probably didn't even have a reason to assume a future conflict with Rome. At this time, he even had legions that were more experienced than the 13th, but they were further away in Gaul. The only advantage I could think of in taking the 13th over his older Spanish legions, for example, would be propaganda. The 13th was raised in northern Italy and so consistent entirely of Italians. Perhaps Caesar marching on Rome followed by pure Italians would sit better in the eyes of the public than if he marched with people of other nations, like whom his other legions would consist of. But again, the main reason could be much simpler than this. The 13th was a battle-hardened and loyal veteran legion, and that was already more than you could say for any other force in Rome that could possibly oppose them. The legion stopped at the Rubicon River, the very border of Italy. If Caesar passed this river, he would have officially invaded Rome and started a civil war. In the dark of dawn, he famously stopped and stood by the river for some time. Many believe it was to rethink his options and make sure he wants to continue the road ahead of him. But Caesar was the type to always plan ahead and was confident in his actions from the very moment he began to march south. Furthermore, he already ordered the 12th and 8th legions to march after him and they were already only a few weeks behind. The real reason why he paused at the Rubicon River is he was waiting for the sun to rise. Now this was surely a matter of propaganda, which Caesar was a master of. Caesar believed that what he was doing was just, and was sure he was a hero in the eyes of the Roman people. He did not want to be invading in darkness, as if he was some thief or enemy. He chose to march in full bright of day through the Roman streets with full confidence, followed by his trusty, now veteran 13th legion. He also wouldn't need a larger army if he got the full support of the people. And so, he crossed the Rubicon with the whisper of his famous phrase, let the die be cast. By Roman law, any general to march their legions out of their appointed province would be committing an act of war, and any soldier that did so, without turning on their commander, would be punished with execution. Caesar's life was now completely in the hands of the 13th. He made sure to give them a long emotional speech before march, something along the lines of, we are all heroes of Rome and shouldn't be treated as traitors. But the public recognized him and saluted him with honor, showing their love and full support for his cause. Caesar was probably also expecting his old 15th legion to join him, as it was still in Italy and was raised by him. With the 13th and 15th legions by his side, he wouldn't have to fear any fresh legions sent to stop him. He sent five cohorts of the 13th legion under Mark Antony to secure Aretium, while ordering three more to take Pisaurum, Thanum, and Ancona, and the remaining two to take Eguvium. There was no opposition, all cities willfully surrendered and supported Caesar. Upon seeing the 13th legion, a lot of the garrisons joined them, bolstering the size of Caesar's army. And it was now that the 12th legion arrived in Italy to support the 13th. Soon the news of Caesar marching on Rome with an army and the surrender of cities without a fight reached the Senate, and it started a lot of panic. Pompey started immediately raising legions in Italy to fight Caesar. And Domitius, a man who was chosen by the Senate to succeed Caesar as governor of Gaul, was not happy about his promotion being compromised. Against all orders, he raised two legions and joined another one sent by Pompey. With a total of three legions, they now held off against Caesar's veterans in a fortified city. Caesar encamped not too far away and was not able to siege a city whose garrison outnumbered his. Some days later, his loyal 8th legion was seen over the horizon recently arriving in Italy to support the 12th and 13th. 
Now the odds were in Caesar's favor, and a few days later the newly recruited three legions offered to switch sides and join Caesar. Caesar gladly accepted and now had around 40,000 men marching with him, a combination of the 13th, several city garrisons, and other veteran and rookie legions. After Pompey heard of Caesar's army, he knew it was a force that could not be stopped. Together with all his supporters, he marched to Brindisi to later sail to Greece. They were escorted by the 15th Legion, which Caesar incorrectly assumed would switch over to support him. Nevertheless, the Italian peninsula now belonged to Caesar. The 13th Legion was ordered to march into Hispania with its brother legion, the 14th, to fight Pompey's best legions at Alerta. The battle was a bloodless victory and the 13th was stationed in Hispania for the time being. They were put under the command of one named Cassius, the current governor of Cordoba. It was under him that an interesting turn of events occurred regarding the 13th and some other legions. Caesar writes that Cassius was a very corrupt and selfish governor. At this time, Cassius was in a lot of personal debt and decided to resolve this by imposing very harsh and unfair taxes on the province of Cordoba. He proceeded to do many immoral things like fake crimes on the rich and force them to pay massive fines on the crimes that they didn't even commit. Personally, I'm very glad that sources like this remain because we can get a true glimpse of what was happening behind the scenes of the Civil War. It wasn't all just noble deeds and fair battles as many sources would have you assume. Some, such as Cassius, saw an opportunity to abuse this state of chaos. And while the attention was shifted elsewhere, he plundered the innocent for his own personal gain. But his legions, 13th included, knew what he was doing. He was so unpopular among his own staff that they even attempted an assassination on him, but he managed to escape. It's always the justified assassinations that don't work. Instead of correctly punishing the caught conspirators, he also forced them to pay him a large fine too, in exchange for their freedom, adding to his reputation of greed. As he left Cordoba on Caesar's orders, the province started an uprising. Soon after this, Cassius heard that the 13th Legion mutinied. They killed several of their centurions that opposed them and elected one named Marcellus as their new general. Then they marched back towards Cordoba to quell the uprising. This must have been a big shock to everyone and a big mystery as to why one of Caesar's most trusted legions would behave in this way. Caesar mentions his thoughts on this matter. He says that the 13th didn't act out of hatred to him nor support to Pompey, but for the pure goal of defying Cassius, as they were fed up with his money-grabbing and looting schemes. The previously Pompeian veteran 2nd Legion and two other rookie legions followed the example of the 13th and marched with them towards Cordoba, while the other legions stayed loyal to Cassius. But they made it very clear to him that their loyalty was only because of their respect to Caesar and not to him. So now there was a little civil war of its own happening behind the scenes, within Caesar's legions. Upon the arrival of the 13th, the citizens of Cordoba begged them not to punish them and told them that they were rebelling against Cassius and not Caesar. Under Marcellus, they set up a camp nearby to ensure the peace. When Cassius arrived with his legions, however, he was infuriated by the uprising of the people and his legions. He wrote to Lepidus and other Roman governors to aid him in his dispute. Then he sent men to burn down houses surrounding Cordoba and loot them as a warning. The 13th were provoked by this indignity and begged Marcellus to allow them to engage Cassius and stop the destruction. Marcellus had no choice to resist the request, and soon the 13th and the other legions charged out and formed a line in front of Cassius' fort, confidently offering an engagement. We are told that Cassius was outnumbered in infantry and so encamped on an elevated ground and did not take the engagement. He instead relied on his dominant cavalry force, who dealt many hit-and-run casualties on the mutineers. Cassius was soon reinforced by a few thousand men from neighboring provinces, since he was currently the highest authority in the province. Now, Cassius' infantry was significantly bolstered, but he still resisted an engagement. Caesar writes that this was because he feared Marcellus's two veteran legions, one of which was the 13th, who at this point was more experienced than any other force present and would have been very difficult to deal with. However, the hit-and-run tactics did not stop, and more of Marcellus's men were killed in the days that followed. In a few days, Lepidus arrived to resolve the conflict between the two. He brought with him three and a half thousand legionaries, and the same amount in auxiliaries and cavalry. He ordered both men to immediately seize combat and give up their legions to him. Marcellus quickly complied and surrendered the 13th and the others to Lepidus. Cassius, on the other hand, was a bit suspicious. First of all, he believed he was right, and second of all, 
He feared that since Marcellus quickly surrendered to Lepidus, the latter would think more favorably towards Marcellus than him. But Lepidus handled the conflict quite well. He personally met with Cassius and assured him his decision would be without prejudice. Reluctantly, Cassius agreed and surrendered his men. Lepidus then was to march into Cardoba to give the province a new governor, but Cassius didn't go with them. According to Caesar, he instead took a ship and sailed away to secure all the riches and plunder that he gained over the months. In a turn of events, he was caught in a strong storm which sank the ship together with him and all his stolen possessions. The way Caesar makes note of this whole incident gives a good impression that he himself despised Cassius's actions in Hispania, and who wouldn't? Caesar also gives the impression that he was quite proud with the actions of the 13th in defying Cassius. They proved to be a very righteous legion that could stand up for what's right at the expense of killing some of their most loyal centurions. If not to the defiance of the 13th, Cordoba would surely be burned, tortured, and pillaged for more loot. The entire province owed its thanks specifically to the 13th for instigating the mutiny. Caesar would now send the 13th to take part in his African campaign, where he stationed them in the very center of his front line at the Battle of Thapsus, which turned out to be a decisive Caesarian victory. All surviving Pompeians now retreated to Hispania to fight the last battle of the Civil War at Munda. This next part might surprise you just as it did me. One of Caesar's best and oldest legions, the 9th, has switched sides against him, and they were joined by the 13th Legion. The two legions were stationed in the nearby town of Cordoba, the same place the 13th protected a few months back, and the locals would have recognized them. Why the veterans were placed away from Munda was probably because it was a huge risk to make Caesarian legions fight each other. They stood by one another for several decades, and it would be a big stretch to expect them to fight effectively against each other. But if there was a guarantee that they would, Munda would end very badly for Caesar, who was already outnumbered and outpositioned, and the victory was a close call. Regardless, the Pompeian survivors and deserters from Munda all retreated towards the 13th and hid themselves at Cordoba, and Caesar pursued them. Caesar notes that upon arriving, many slaves and soldiers from Cordoba came out and surrendered to him, including his old 9th legion. But the 13th prepared to defend the town. The 13th put up a fierce resistance, so much that Caesar had to call in more legions. In the end, Cordoba was taken, and 22,000 were slaughtered on the spot in the bloodlust of the Caesarian legions. We could imagine a lot of these men were of the 13th. The same men that stood by Caesar when he crossed the Rubicon, the same men he once trusted more than anyone with his life. Such was the harshness of the civil wars. It is very difficult to make a sense of these happenings. We can understand the ninth swapping sides, since their veterans were many years past their retirement and were fed up with Caesar's promises that never materialized. They even mutinied a few years back. But the 13th was indeed a surprise. It could have been due to the strict orders from their commanders who for some reason found it necessary to swap sides. What could be understood, however, is their fierce opposition at Cordoba, given they helped protect it against other Caesarian legions a few months back as well. Apart from the citizens, now they also felt the responsibility to protect thousands of fleeing Pompeian legionaries as well, many of which were young recruits fearing for their lives. In the end, many of the 13th surrendered, and their numbers were refilled, and the legion survived. Caesar was soon to be assassinated, and another civil war began. Many of Caesar's old legions, such as the 10th and 13th, joined his second-in-command Mark Antony, while the others joined his adopted son Octavian. Now, what Octavian liked to do is fill in the gaps of missing legions by raising new ones. He didn't have the 10th Equestris by him, so he raised his own 10th legion. He didn't have the 13th by him, so he also raised another 13th. So now there were two 13th legions in existence. But in 30 BC, a new legion came to play, a 13th titled Gemina, which means twins. Generally, this title was given to a legion when it was merged with another. We know for sure that one of these was an existing 13th, and given that from this point on there was only one 13th, we can deduce that the 13th Gemina was indeed a merge of the two existing 13th legions after Octavian obtained command of both. One of these was Caesar's original, and the other was Octavian's. This is how the legion got its title, from now on being known as 13th Gemina. In around 36 BC, we know that one of Octavian's best generals and probably all-time best admiral, Marcus Agrippa, has boarded many of Octavian's legions to his ships. The 13th was one of those chosen to fight as marines and participate in the battles of Milae and Nocolis, winning them both. In the years that followed, Octavian received the title Augustus and became the sole ruler of Rome. 
In 15 BC, he stationed the legion in Raetia to guard the Roman border from one of its most terrifying enemies on the other side. In 9 AD, a terrible incident took place that would question the empire's dominance for centuries. Three full Roman legions that crossed the Rhine were wiped out entirely by the Germanic tribes. The 13th legion at this time was close by and would have been shocked by the news. For the first time, the Germanic people have created a chink in the armor of Rome's largest and most defended border, and now the security of the whole empire was put under question. The borders were quickly reinforced, but Rome could never forget such a defeat. As long as the three golden eagles of the fallen legions remained in the hands of the enemy, it was an endless reminder of the vulnerability of the Roman army and a disgrace to the other legions. Four years later, Germanicus was appointed commander of the eight legions stationed on the Rhine, one of which was the 13th. Together with them, he marched on three vicious campaigns of looting and burning of the Germanic tribes, and if fate had it, relieved the shame of the fallen legions by retrieving their lost golden eagles. There, the 13th Legion defeated many of the tribes that personally massacred the three legions. Along the conquest, two out of the three eagles were recovered. The last one has never been found to this day. Plutarch writes that if Germanicus had the full authority to seize the whole of Germania, he could have. But the motive of the campaigns was only to avenge the fallen legions, and it was a great success. Emperor Tiberius recalled the general back to Rome and gave him a proper triumph in his honor. The 13th took up its previous position on the Rhine, with the added satisfaction of avenging their fellow legions. There was a dispute in 69 AD over four influential men, each one fighting for the position of emperor. The 13th supported Otho and marched against Vitellius's legions, but lost the first battle of Bedriacum in Italy. The 13th was apparently routed by another famous legion, the 5th Alidae. The 13th surrendered and was this time stationed in Pannonia to once again guard the Rhine. Despite the temporary peace, some of the legions were not all right with having Vitellius as their emperor, and instead vowed to put Vespasian on the throne. In the same year, many generals from different legions started plotting a rebellion at the very headquarters of the 13th Legion, which we could assume was the biggest supporter of this cause, eager to avenge their recent defeat in Bedriacum. The 13th, together with the other legions, fought a battle against Vitellius's legions at the Second Battle of Bedriacum, and this time ended up victorious, avenging their honor and getting their pride back. They soon fought the Battle of Cremona and the Battle of Rome, winning both and setting Vespasian as the new emperor of Rome. This would be the second ruler that the 13th personally placed in power despite the opposition of other Roman legions, the first being Julius Caesar, and it would have been well respected for it by legions and generals alike. An interesting fact is that one of the tribunes of the 13th legion at this time was the father of the famous author and historian Suetonius, from whom I get a lot of information for my videos. He was to be born in the following year, and if this rebellion would fail, we would have lost a very important source of knowledge of the Roman Empire. Our next mention of the 13th is in the Dacian campaigns, where they were the first to test out new innovative armor, specifically created to counter the Dacian Falk Sword, feared for its deadly penetrating ability. One of the armor improvements was two metal cross guards on the helmet, and the other was the Manica, a sleeve that the gladiators wore to protect their sword arm, but it was made fully metal. The 13th and the other legions served under Trajan in two hard-fought wars against the Dacians. One of the most famous was fought in a thunderstorm. Headhunting was illegal in the Roman Empire, but it seems exceptions were made in this bloody conflict, as soldiers were depicted bringing severed heads to their commanders in exchange for rewards. After the campaign, the 13th had the honor of setting up a fort at Apollum, the very center of the new Dacian province. Its veterans would be later discharged and given lands in the very capital of Dacia. By 395 AD, the legion was restationed to Egypt, where we unfortunately lose track of it. It is known that unlike many legions, the 13th Gemina still kept the lion as its emblem, a tribute to its Caesarian origin. At this point, the collapse of the Western Empire was imminent, and the 13th was probably soon to get massacred by future barbarian invasions, or perhaps find its way into the salvation of the Eastern Roman Empire. The true end to the 13th Legion is unfortunately lost to history. As always, thanks a lot for watching and supporting my channel. Comment below which Legion I should cover next. A special thanks from me goes to my very generous Patreon supporters. I'll see you all in the next one.